All right, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, or good night, uh, wherever you are joining us. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, my name is Monica Fabianska, and I will be the moderator of tonight's conversation, which is the third and the last one in the series of conversations around the idea of ecofeminism, which is organized uh, by Thomas Urban Gallery as um, a program uh, in conjunction with my exhibition on view at the gallery right now, which is titled Ecofeminisms. Uh, the exhibition is open in the physical space of the gallery in Chelsea with all possible uh, safety uh, measures that we could uh, propose to make it a safe experience uh, for everyone who decides to come to the gallery. Although I'm always very, very careful making this invitation. Uh, health is a personal matter. And, uh, and we are of different health. And if, if, if you don't have a safety way to get to the gallery, hopping on subway may not be a good idea. You can always see the exhibition online. We already and finally have a walkthrough, which is uh, available on Instagram with my commentary. Uh, and it's a slow walk through all the works in the, in the gallery. So you will really have an experience of seeing the exhibition. You are now uh, seeing uh, the images. And we also organized a series of conversations uh, with our artists and with uh, three eminent uh, special guests. Uh, all three conversations will be available um, as recordings for everyone who didn't, uh, who could not join us uh, for them. Which uh, leads me to the next point, if anybody would not like to be recorded, it's the time to log off. Uh, of course, uh, there is another way to do that, you don't have to ask the questions and, and you may, and you may uh, not remain behind, remain behind a, a black screen, not making your face visible. Um, we will have this discussion for about an hour or so with three artists and our special guests whom I will introduce in a moment. Um, but um, after an hour, we will uh, move to a Q&A session and whoever would like to ask the question, please use the time either during the conversation or during the Q&A session to ask it in a chat. Uh, but also remember that I see that chat as a long stripe on my screen and reading very long questions is sometimes uh, a little complicated. So the, the, lo the shorter you make them, the easier you make them for me for me to read aloud and, and the more of them I will be able to read aloud. Uh, so I'd like to greet uh, our wonderful guests, Betsy Damon, uh, Eliza Evans, and Carla Maldonado, the three artists who are in the, in the show, as well as critic uh, and writer Eleanor Hartney. And I will introduce uh, each of them uh, explaining um, uh, to reading to you uh, their biographies. Um, let me just make a very, very short introduction to what we will be speaking about. Uh, Ecofeminism as an exhibition was thought of, a, of as a research project. Uh, so I'm not trying to, Tyler, wait a, wait, wait a moment with this. Um, it was not, uh, uh, it is not proposing one answer to what ecofeminism could be. And certainly it is not uh, in any way exhaustive and presenting the artists who contributed to this incredibly interesting trend or movement, uh, whichever uh, 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 word we agree to, to define it by. Uh, it is an invitation to a reflection, a contemporary reflection on what women 50 years ago brought to our attention and what we maybe didn't listen to when we should, and maybe uh, what we could uh, take from their wisdom now and how that wisdom uh, is reflected in today's, uh, uh, um, in, in, the, in the sensitivity of the artists working together today with the whole understanding that of course the situation of women both in the society and on the art market is entirely different today than it was 50 years ago. Maybe not entirely, but radically different. And also with our understanding that the definition of gender, gender changed. So can we really uh, speak about ecofeminist art today? Is a work um, environment of environmental art created by a male artist or an artist avoiding uh, cisgender definition identity um, different or not 
from, from a woman's uh, artwork? Is, should we even expect that? These are provocative questions. It's not that I uh, don't have my, my ideas about them, but this is also why I would like to listen from you, the guests whom we invited, and especially Eleanor Hartney. And not only that she's an incredible uh, critic and writer, but um, in May of this year, uh, she published a major article in Art in America titled, uh, what's the title? All or Nothing about ecofeminist art. And I am more, more than happy that she agreed to be in our conversation. So without further ado, let me introduce Eliana to you while Tyler will show um, uh, this uh, well-illustrated and fantastic article. I really um, want all of you to read it. Eleanor Hartney is an art critic and author and has written extensively on contemporary art issues for many publications, including Art in America, Art Press, Art News, Art and Auction, The New Art Examiner, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. Her books include Critical Condition, American Culture at the Crossro Crossroads, Postmodernism, Defending Complexity, Art Politics and the New World Order, Postmodern Heretics, The Catholic Imagination in Contemporary Art, Art and Today, and this is actually an encyclopedia, it's not a book, and Doomsday Dreams, The Apocalyptic Imagination in Contemporary Art. She is a co-author of Art After the Revolution, Women Who Transformed Contemporary Art, and The Reckoning, Women Artists of the New Millennium. Tyler, can you show us the following pages? She is... Um, past president of ICA USA, the American, can you slide through them one after another? Because I'm already done with, almost with the bi biography. Eleanor Hartney is past president of ICA USA, the American section of the International Art Critics Association. Her awards include the College Art Association's Frank Jewett Smather Award and the French government's Chevalier dans l'Or des Arts et des Lettres. Welcome, Eleanor. I'm very happy that we have you. But before you speak, we will, of course, have all three artists presenting uh, their work first before, before, before we start uh, discussing them. So I'd like to first introduce Betsy Damon. Betsy is water artist whose public work and living systems have received widespread acclaim. She created important feminist ritual performances in public space in New York, 7,000-year-old woman, blind. I'm sorry, we hear everyone. Tyler, could you possibly mute all the participants except for the speakers? Thank you. Betsy Damon created important feminist ritual performances in public space in New York including 7,000-year-old woman, 76-79, blind beggar woman from 1979 to 81, a rape memory, 1981-83, the shrine for every woman, 1985-1990, and a meditation with stones for the survival of the planet, 1983-89. And she exhibited at PS1 among the other venues in the, in the 80s. The installation, The Memory of Clean Water, which is shown in our exhibition and you now see it on the screen, I mean, it's a small fragment, uh, was shown at Everhart Museum and traveled to many other museums between 1986 and 1991. At the age of 50, Betsy changed the focus of her art to center on water, its conservation and protection, and its impact on the society. Among her large-scale projects, mobilizing art, science, and communities around local water problems are those in, are those uh, such as Living Water Garden in Chengdu, China, 1996, uh, the projects for Beijing uh, Bureau of Hydraulic Research and Engineering, also in China, of course, 2001 to 2003, Olympic Forest Park in Beijing, 2002 to 2006, Projects in Larimer, Pennsylvania from 2012 to 16, and on the Cheyenne River in, Northern, in North Dakota. Betsy, over to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is 
Uh, this is a piece I did in the streets of New York City, which is meditation with stones for the survival of the planet. And um, I did it, I did it every full moon in the Soho Gallery for a year and then on the streets. And um, people really got healed by stones. And after that, we thought about what you could do for the planet. Like part of what I love to do is get people thinking about the planet and what's going on. And um, okay, next slide. <laughs> And this is doing the Living Water Garden. I, I think they're going to show part of it. But we all, I gathered a group of um, paper makers, or whether they gathered me, I'd say. And um, I was in a car with them in Canada, and I asked each of them, what would you do if you had all the money and resource and time, and what would you make? And they told me, and um, then they asked me, and I said, oh, I can't do what I really want to do. And they said, well, what is it? And I said, I'd like to uh, cast a dry riverbed in handmade paper. And they came to a screeching halt on the side of the highway from 80 miles an hour, stopped the car, and turned around and said, you can do that, and we'll help you. So then that really, that energy really got it going. And we went and lived together in an empty house in Castle Valley, where, which at that time was unoccupied, and worked together for, um, five, six weeks, it was fabulous. It was so fabulous. We, we made um, a lot of things from the environment, a lot of the paper from what we gathered, the, the textures were from the stones, which we ground up and um, it was a dream. I, w I could have done it for six months. Anyway, uh, the piece um, came off and it was first shown at Eberhardt and then at PS1. And people really thought I was exaggerating, that I sort of lost my mind when I said, you know, water quality is a huge issue, a huge issue. And it was this piece when I was working on it one day for 10 hours and I looked up at the sky and there was the Milky Way coming out. And I went and I said, oh, it looks just like the river bit. And, I, and then I thought, everything's patterned by water and I know nothing, I mean nothing. And in fact, most of us know very little really about water, except our water bill and whether it comes or it goes. Um, so that um, propelled me on my journey to learn about water. Um, I think that's, I don't know if that's five minutes or not. <laughs> oh, not yet, you can, you can keep talking. <laughs> and I learned the next day. Uh, this is the whole installation, right? This is, uh, this is 250 meters long, right? Well, this is part of 250 meters long. And um, the next day I also learned that the indigenous people call the Milky Way the River of Stones. Well, And um, I mean, I could tell a lot of stories from this time uh, of working in the val this valley, which was really unoccupied. Uh, and was clearly a wintering site for indigenous people. And um, Victor Masiev, the Hopi artist, um, was photographing the place or filming it. And I hadn't told him where we would be. Now we thought we were super careful, like we hadn't disturbed anything. We didn't use anything polluting. We tried to leave it as we found it. Well, he could find us in a nanosecond. And I said, how did you find us? He said, oh, I can find a bunch of white people anywhere easily. <laughs> and we all you know, laughed because we, compared to what he could do, we did disturb the environment. Anyway, this set me on my journey and um, I became, it took me a number of years to figure out what I could do to, um, after I was learning about water, what I could do as an artist. And I realized I, I was, I had devoted myself to water, but I, I couldn't objectify water anymore. Like water became my teacher, water became the verb, water became um, the container in which I work now, and that I knew nothing about. And now we're used to objectifying water now. You know, it's, it's hoarded, we, we buy it, we think it's okay that it's in a bottle. Um, and so that really turned me upside down. What could I do? And I decided to only do things that would interact positively with the uh, ecosystems. But I didn't know what that was. Right. And, uh, and as I tried, clearly other people didn't understand me. <laughs> so next journey. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will hear next, we will come back to Betsy and do the ideas that are in, in her art. Uh, where I am currently, a, a big storm is coming. I hope that we won't lose the connection. Yes. Um, let me read Eliza Evans' uh, uh, bio next, and she will introduce her work in the exhibition. Eliza Evans experiments with sculpture, print, video, and textiles to identify disconnections and absurdities in social, economic, and ecological systems. The initial parameters of each work are carefully researched and then evolve as a result of interaction with people, time, and weather. Evans was born in a rust-built steel town and raised in rural Appalachia. She currently splits her time between New York City and the Hudson Valley, New York. Her work was exhibited in the Chautauqua Institution in Chautauqua, also New York, Edward Hopper House Museum in Nyack, Choshama Sculpture Field in Pine Plains, and Brick in Brooklyn, as well as Purchase College, Purchase New York. Residences include the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at UC Santa Barbara this year in 2020, the Bronx Museum uh, Program AIM, where I had uh, the pleasure of meeting her, and it was a very fruitful meeting, and Franconia Sculpture Park, uh, Schaefer, Minnesota. Uh, Eliza Evans holds an MFA from SUNY Purchase College in Visual Art and a PhD in Economic Sociology from the University of Texas at Austin. Eliza, to you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, I apologize. I'm going to stop my video uh, because I ended up with some unexpected Wi-Fi issues and I think that will help the experience. But my work uh, in this show is a piece called All the Way to Hell. And there's a physical instantiation in the, the column of geological samples that are, are stacked on the wall and then a single piece of paper, just a simple eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Uh, the column are uh, geological samples pulled out of shale formations. Spe this one specifically is from the Permian Basin. So this is one of the most productive oil, oil fields in the nation. And these things are proprietary. So getting my hands on these was no small feat. And it's to give a little bit of physicality to what is basically a conceptual project. Yeah, sorry, Tyler, if you can go to, to the deed. Thanks. So this is the heart of the project. This is a, a quick claim mineral deed to property that I own, or the mineral rights that I own in Oklahoma. I inherited them from a great aunt uh, and she got them from her father. I have never been to Oklahoma, but somehow I, I, uh, I own this. And now there are developers, oil and gas developers, who are interested in, in purchasing or leasing my mineral rights. Now, not everything I do is environmental art, but it's certainly a, a large part of my practice and, and my, because it evinces my value system. So. I'm not particularly enthused about participating with these oil and gas companies. Um, Tyler, can you go to the next one, please? So oh, this, is, this is what uh, the land looks like. This is not what I own. What I own is under the surface. And this was something that was very alien to me and I had to educate myself on it. And so, and, and so of course, I'm a researcher by training. So of course it all, is incorporated uh, into, into my work. Can we go to the next one? Right, so I own three acres, which is the green dot within a larger 155 acre tract. And in the yellow box is the amount of acreage that the oil and gas company needs to lock up via leases. And in Oklahoma, they only have to lease half of this land and then they can force the other half in, uh, into the, the, what they call the drilling unit. So I can't say no, My, the, the amount of land that I have is far too small. Uh, so, so they essentially can force me. Uh, however, 
I'm a stubborn person and I don't like being told what to do, so as, like most artists. So Tyler, can you go to the next slide, please? So this is me alone uh, in, inside the drilling unit looking for options. So you can go to the next. So uh, property law in the US is based on the ad coelum doctrine. So in theory, property rights extend to the heavens and they extend all the way to hell, you know, the, into the center of the earth. And so while my eight, my, the surface area of my mineral rights is only three acres, it extends, uh, in theory at least, to the center of the earth. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I've, I've combed through a lot of uh, law, law journal articles and, and landman manuals to get, try and get a handle on this. And then I had to go get some professional help uh, from an actual legal professional. And so the outcome of that is what is presented in this show. So let's go to the next one, Tyler. So um, what I propose to do is to divide my three acres into a thousand different segments and to sell them off for $65 each. And that covers the legal fees, the filing fees, because it's really important that everything uh, conform to the, the bureaucratic regime, because that's how we're going to break it. Uh, so, so I, so because and the reason why this is so critical is the, the oil companies do have to track down every single owner. They at least have to offer a contract and they have to register all of that activity with the state. Uh, this takes time and this takes money. And often they go through intermediaries, through brokers uh, called landmen. And if the landman saw this in the middle of the property he wanted, he would just walk away because it's way too much effort uh, and, it's, and, and the, the fees are substantial. So, so what we're doing is cr creating a platform for what could be a hundred year, uh, pr year protest. Um, you know, we, we know we have to act before that, but a uh, hundred years is good enough. This has already been in my family inactive for a hundred years. So hopefully it will remain inactive. Uh, Eliza, people who Eliza can you tell us how we can join this project? Sure. Well, thanks to COVID, I had to reimagine the way I was going to do this project. I had uh, pictured myself doing art residencies and traveling all the country and going to art, arts and crafts fairs and offering what they offer in those contexts, you know, an art adjacent context or is an as a, a different aesthetic experience. Uh, but because of COVID, I, I have started a company. It's called, it's called all, all the way to hell and you can call find it at all the way to hell.com. And I mean, I would, I would love it if people would sign up and buy the shares. And that is certainly not the only way to participate. Um, for, for those who are, uh, who really like the project and, and can afford it, you can actually buy uh, portions for other people who can't afford it. Because what matters is not that, is that there are many of us, uh, that this is lots of ind individuals acting collectively, but not as a proper collective, because bu bureaucracies don't like that. Um, uh, the other, but also, uh, in, instead of going to arts and crafts fairs or environmental groups, um, I've been doing lots of Zoom calls. So if you belong to any kind of organization that would like to find out more about this project, uh, I, I'd be welcome to, to talk. Uh, also, I, I'm also trying to reach out to landowners who may find themselves in a similar circumstance. So in all the big oil plays in the US, we have Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, uh, and not New York because we have a fracking ban for the moment, but for those landowners who aren't keen to have fracking on their land, I, I'd just love to share with them my research and maybe that could be a basis for a partnership or just information sharing. 
So on the website, I, I outline a, a number of ways um, that you know perhaps we can find some alignments, even if it's just sharing resources. Right. Thank you so very much. We need to go to Carla. I will only um, um, summarize this saying that I always associate that work not only with Avido, Aviva Rahmani's project, Blue Tree Symphony, but also with Agnes Dennis' idea of uh, planting a forest uh, where she used many people. Everybody was planting one tree. And I think that would be wonderful if we would really all uh, join Eliza in that effort. Uh, the idea was originally, as far as I remember, that the share will cost $10. There's some extra like county clerk administration fees, but we will, we will, we will still hope it will land below uh, 100 or even below $75. And it would be wonderful if people would like to help us start this project and serve it uh, for, the, for, for the entire uh, community of landowners who don't want to be frackers in this country. Uh, Carla Maldonado, uh, a Brazilian artist living in New York City now, uh, let me introduce her, is one of, maybe, maybe she is the youngest artist in the exhibition. She is a multimedia artist working in photography, film, and installation. Her work responds to social political issues, patriarchy, and the environmental crisis, and explores the struggle of progressive movements in Bolsonaro, Brazil, her immigrant experience in Trump's era US. Maldonado's intuitively observational process is based on photographic and video documentation of environments she navigates and people she encounters, focusing on rebels, misfits, and revolutionaries. She showed at the satellite art show in Miami and, and, and Brooklyn, film fest at the farm in Rhinebeck, New York, School of Visual Arts, New York City, Somat Studio also in New York City, as well as Barcelona Planet Film Festival in Spain and the Knockdown Center in Brooklyn. She has BFA in fashion design from Senai Satik in Rio de Janeiro from 2007 and MFA in photography, video and related media from School of Visual Arts in New York in 2019. And now she is uh, also a fellow of the AIM program at the Bronx Museum through which we also met each other. And to you, Carla. Hi, um, so let me talk a little bit about the project that I'm showing in this amazing show. Um, Dystopia of a Jungle City and the Human of Nature. It's a film I made in collaboration with the Sibia Community Center in Manaus, Brazil. And uh, the video starts what you're looking at now um, with Bolsonaro speaking about his first visit to the Amazon forest after he got elected. And um, I end the video with my personal hero and the most inspiring indigenous activist and congresswoman in Brazil, Sonia Guajajara, as she speaks at the first indigenous women's march she organized last year in Brazil. So throughout the video, um, I take the viewer with me as a follow Mr. Domingos, the shaman of the community, and his wife, Ms. Yoso Camo. And my favorite thing about her is, one of my favorite things about her, and what inspired me a lot to do this video, is uh, the relationship with her name in her native language, that Yoso Camo means human of nature. So that's why uh, the name of the video. And then um, throughout, uh, I just walk around with them and share the things that I learned from them, what, how I see them as the guardians of the forest. And during the make of this film, there was absolutely no plot, uh, nothing was staged, no conversations were repeated. The sky is falling down. Um, no conversations were repeated and there was absolutely no production besides me and my camera. So the only reason why this film exists is because of the openness of the community and to me and to the camera that I had and the connection we made as humans and the stories that ended up developing from this cultural exchange. The video was shot in 2018 during my first visit to the community and later in 2019 when I came back to visit them. Um, and in the film, I mix different elements that also refers to my psychological state when I was editing it in 2019, right after the presidential election in Brazil, um, dealing with Bolsonaro taking away all indigenous rights as fast as he could. So my voiceover in this film alerts about 
pr the President Bolsonaro disrespect for indigenous lands, uh, indigenous people, and indigenous culture, and the danger they're facing under this government and his genocide politics. The film is also fragmented in four different screens, or in this case, one screen differented in four part, fragmented in four parts. And the idea behind it is also the complexity of the indigenous culture and their surrounding. So I really require an active viewer to experience and search for the image or the storyline or the information they're following when they're watching it. And I just, I mean, as I know that the imagery is beautiful because I'm filming in the Amazon forest and there's no way to get away from it. But I just, I hope to move away from the idealization of the indigenous people and the romanticism that Western co culture perpetuates when depicting their reality. It's very important to talk about their displacement issues and the lack of politics made for them. And right now what you see is Sonia Guajajara talking on the march and really actively um, being completely against what's happening right now and the reality that she's facing in Brazil. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very happy that we had time to read those uh, subtitles. I always think looking at this last sequence of the movie that Carla did, that sh what she presents to us is something that is so rarely presented in mainstream. We tend to, f to see indigenous people as helpless and vulnerable and without their voice. And she shows that they are educated, powerful, political, and that they do have their voice. And she only transmits that voice to us. Uh, so I'd like to I'd like us to go to the to the to the first question and maybe Eliana uh, Hartney could now chime in and there is there are a few critics who wrote more about political art and about activism uh, in art than you and I'd like you to to talk to us about what plays uh, what role it plays in echo feminism in this artist ever how do you see that uh, well first um, first of all I just want I want to say that, Monica, congratulations to you for putting together this incredibly timely show and congratulations to all the artists. And it's, it's especially now, you know, we're in the midst of this whole sort of COVID nightmare, but it's important to remember that there are even more kind of vital and, and uh, pressing issues that are coming upon us and are just sort of waiting in the wings. Um, in terms of the question of activism, yeah, I've, I've always, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of writing about um, ecological art. It's something I've been interested in for a long time. And I've always been drawn in particular to the idea that artists, it's one of the areas where I think artists really can make a difference. You know, there's always this question, can art make change? Um, and, you know, is, is art simply showing us, you know, kind of the difficulties, the problems, or is art really proposing possible solutions? And I think when it comes to ecological art, that that is one area where it's absolutely true. And it, it, it's, it's been, to me, one of the most exciting areas of art to follow, because these are places where people can have an impact, they can have agency. Part of it is because, you know, these artists will uh, work with lots of other people. Um, they, they go across disciplinary lines um, and they often have ways of, of offering, you know, they, they'll enter into um, a discussion that's already happening and they will have an innovative and different way of thinking about it. I mean, I think for example, the way that Eliza is thinking about how do we deal with this, you know, the problem of, of um, eminent domain and, and, you know, kind of our loss of our, our power over the, you know, our own land. And she's come up with an incredibly innovative way of dealing with that, which, you know, plays with and uses the legal system. I mean, I think Aviva Romani's um, solution is, is very similar. She spoke in the last um, Zoom conference that you had here. But um, so I think that I, I think that for ecological art, yeah, activism is, you know, I mean, it, it's what makes it ecological art in a way. 
it's it's also at the wonderful crossroads where activism and feminism and eco arts yeah. come together. That's a powerful cocktail that we that we have here. Yeah. Uh, go on. Well, I'm just going to say I, I know we're going to talk in a little bit about about um, the, what ecofeminism itself is. So I'm, I'll kind of maybe hold off till we get to that question. But yes, I think that there's a whole kind of, in a way the essence, I see the essence of ecological art as also being feminist, but we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Betsy, Carla and Eliza, would you talk to us about what activism, because what, what fascinates me is that it's very present in uh, the three very different uh, bodies of, of work that you that you create, uh, but in a very different way. Could you each talk to us what activism is to you? And maybe we should start with Betsy, actually, again. And I'm going to provoke you, and I will quote uh, from what you wrote. <laughs> but here we, I don't remember now where I found it, but uh, in 1981 manifesto for No Limits for Women Arts, uh, for Women Artists, one of many organizations of feminist artists that you co-created, uh, you wrote, the nature of art is activist. Well, I think that's actually true. It's only recently that art has been turned into, especially this kind of material, high volume thing that has, that's vacuous. <laughs> and I think uh, we can see in the movement like, um, of, say, Black, Black Lives Matter or where different groups have created their own language for activism over the past period of time. But, you know, Picasso's work was activist often. Or go back and we, if we go back in time, um, uh, all through the Middle Ages, the building of a cathedral. <laughs> All those things were, in a way, activist. They weren't separate from the heart of the community, from the, what people believed in. And now we have this whole art market that's separate. <laughs> and I can remember, I can remember when I had some beautiful visual work, but if it had any meaning in it, they weren't interested in buying it. I said it had to be meaningless. And we celebrate that, we honor that. <laughs> in this right. odd way that's corporate, that is corporate. So yes, I, I'm, I stand there and I, I've struggled, I had to struggle with it myself because I was raised, you know, like, but, um, and I know in the rail they said that I turned away from art when I, uh, with, the, with the Living Water Garden, but uh, there's some slides I have here. If, Show us Tyler, could you show us the project from Chengdu? The, the, uh, the art project, but I, I, I got art. I get artists together, and we together we no the one before it, <laughs> the, the slide before that. Yeah, this no before before before, back. Oh, oh well, artist. Okay, um, I I had a slide of some of the artwork that was created by twenty five artists. Um, a gathering of Tibetans, um, Chinese, and one or two Americans. And that, that actually opened up the city because we did it along the river and it was ca called for, uh, you know, for the water quality of the river, we did it along the river. And that got the city interested. And then they talked to me and they showed me their plans. And I, I said to them, well, why don't you make a park? They had a, a park plan. There's no river restoration in the United States that has a park plan with it. These Chinese had 19, 19 kilometers of park for the center of their city. No, not a hotel, not a restaurant, not a movie theater, not a river walk like San Antonio, which is really dreadful, and, um, but park. And so I said, why don't you make a park to teach people how nature cleans water? And they said to me, can you do that? And well, actually, frankly, I'd never done it. And I was shaking and I nodded my head, yes. <laughs> and then they had a long discussion and they told me they wanted to, me to give up the art, the public performance that they believed it was a waste of time and everything. But um, I said, we can do that. And so, after, and they said, well, we'll watch you carefully. And if we like what you do, then you'll be invited back. So it was the 20, these 25 amazing art pieces they were collaborative. They were collaborative with the city. People turned out for free to give the artist something. Um, it was amazing, like the ceiling lifted off a city. So, um, Tyler, Tyler, can you show us the bird's view again of the 
of the park. Yes, you can That's see the, the size of it. Yeah, and the reason, I mean, you could say it's landscape design, but what makes the park work are the art features in it. Like, they show how water moves, and um, it's a whole deep design here that, um, if you separate out the water features anywhere, you get dead water. Now, if we put it all in a pipe and we own it somewhere else, but in this park, everything's connected from beginning to end. So it stays alive no matter how abused it is or neglected. You can go to the next. And the flow forms are a whole thing about water always moves in a vortex motion. Now, how do you exploit that in a city? And this is done in Europe quite a bit, but here it's like, eh, that doesn't make any difference. It makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. I've studied it and gone to conferences with the scientists and um, how the, like nature would, water, all our rivers would clean themselves if we could stop polluting them or right. pollute them less. They would naturally come back. We wouldn't, we could end this climate chaos Thing if we took out down our dams and connected up our rivers and restored the water system, we could seriously interrupt what's happening. So um, I just try to make examples, and um, but I made all, I made the sculptures, uh, and this is why the children and everybody's so fascinated with the park is because they can actually see the water moving and they can see which plants clean it and they can see the whole system. So it was. I could say a, high, a really high point in my life. <laughs> and um, if you also make it now a high point in our lives, I think the, the real, um, you know, you, you make, as a curator, you make exhibitions out of curiosity. And the more curious you are about something that you don't understand, the more you want to show it in your show. At least that's how it works for me. Mm -hmm. And I realized at some point that especially those artists who work, uh, those women who worked with waste and wasteland and the contamination and, and toxicity, they went the farthest uh, of, uh, out of the gallery space where they were never invited in the first place to begin in the 1970s or 60s. Um, and that this radicalism uh, by a lot of, uh, a big part of the society could be called, as you said, urban planning. Somebody just wrote in the chat, in the chat that's way more than urban planning. And I hope that this exhibition brings this new there, there, I mean, when, you, when we look at you and when you did it, we can't even say this is a new art form, but for such a big portion of the society, it's still something new. And it's heartbreaking that uh, so much of it we are only dis discussing now and maybe we should have done it before. And well, I've, been, I've been asked into lots of urban planning things. Believe me, they do not reconnect the systems in the city. Right. They don't divide them, fracture them more. Oh, oh that's, we can pay for that here and that here, but they don't reconnect the systems. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You won't have a future. Yeah. yeah I was okay. going to say, yeah, I mean, I think that this, this question of, is it art? It, it always comes up with ecological art, especially, you know, it's kind art, of art that's actually, art. You know, <laughs> is it art, is it art, you know, it, this, this question, but, you know, the, what artists have to offer, as Betsy says, is that a kind of interconnected consciousness, because you have all, all of these separate little disciplines, you know, and they have their ways of doing things. And what an artist does is come in and see the whole thing and, and often can see these connections and see these solutions or these ideas that basically, you know, the, the disciplines are blind to. So what makes it art, I think, is that interconnective vision. And artists, that's what artists have to offer. And that as I think um, why more and more these ec very interesting ecological projects, you know, are coming out of the heads of artists and then they're working with lots of other people. And, you know, it, it's, it's not about, you know, kind of someone having their, you know, signature, you know, style, their, their, you know, their, their signature name on the whole thing. But, but, but what makes it art is that, is that different way of thinking. I also think what it brings us to is, 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 is trying to deconstruct this modernist wall between art and science and, and building the connection that was lost. We have a doctor in economical science, Eliza Evans. Can you talk about what activism is for you? 
in well, your practice? Sure. And, and I think it's uh, drafting off of the comments, you know, what it, is it art? I, I'm getting asked that. And, and, and it doesn't bother me because I'm, I'm purposely putting myself in these uh, art adjacent or sometimes not art involved spaces uh, so that I can have different conversations in a different audience. You know, we, um, Eleanor talked about the, the, the cross disciplinarity of environmental artists, but the, 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 the audience is also uh, uh, very diverse. Uh, and I know that's one of the things that attracts me to the field. Um, you know, my audience, uh, I mean, I'm interested in, in native land rights, given where my own particular property is. There are a lot of issues that I care about, but my target audience are other mineral owners because, you know, it's invisible. They're very, these people are hard to find, but last year or two years ago, 12 million families received $22 billion in oil and gas royalties. It's the, there's this huge, this huge economy and it's just probably from the, then they probably got the, the mineral rights the way I did. They inherited them uh, and they may not even live in the community where they own the resources. Uh, so I think just bringing some daylight to that entire process and and what are they doing? This is, this is, this is, it's fracking. This is what, what's going on. Uh, and right now they're hiding. And I think uh, some conversations need to be had. But I think um, what Eleanor, the term she used uh, uh, for the Harrisons was instigator. And I think that is a word that I'm using more and more now because it, it's, it's like striking a match or asking a question and, and really let the response evolve over time in collaboration with other people in other contexts. Right. I also think your, your, your activism is also education. Education is such an important work in your practice. Oh, for sure. Um, Carla, how about, your storm is now above my head, so I put the earplugs in so that you don't hear the, the, the storm. What's going on here is just, totally crazy. Uh, Carla, can you talk to us about what activism is in your practice? I think my art merges with activism because it's political. Um, my work is very much about documenting uh, my surroundings and the way that I navigate the world. So I'm from Brazil. I have to deal with Bolsonaro being the president of Brazil. I have to deal with being an immigrant with Trump being the president in the USA. So I feel like it's not really something that I ever thought about doing. It's, and I feel like it applies both to Betsy and Eliza too. I feel like we find ourselves in this situation because that's the only way we can find to respond to the reality that we find ourselves in. And I mean, with showing my work here, especially in the USA, it's very important because I end up having many conversations about my work and educating people about Brazil's reality, including its messed up human rights, literally Bolsonaro, first day of office, taking away as many indigenous human rights he could right away, first day of office. Um, the fires in the Amazon forest that were actually caused by criminal gangs last year, and it's probably gonna come full force this year again because of deforestation being huge and, and largely uh, expanding in Brazil because of Bolsonaro's politics. Um, so I just find myself, uh, especially with the American audience, uh, teaching people about human rights in Brazil, colonization, and even remind people sometimes that Brazil is in Latin America. Some people just don't remember that. Um, I just feel like, yeah, it's activism because me as a human being, I don't live a day without talking about or thinking about social change and this reality that we live. Um, so I think it's just a natural thing for me. I never really made a decision or dealt with it. It's just how my creative process work and where my mind is at. Right. Andrea Bowers often says that her biggest ambition is really to document the current moment and the current activism and that becomes her art. Uh, 
And I think that for many of it's just one stream and one river uh, that they enter. It's, and it's, but we also have to see through this, um, uh, through this exhibition or through articles like the one Eliana wrote for Art in America that it was present in women's work uh, 50 years ago. And it's something that we can learn a lot from. I, speaking about this, I would like to now tr try to go back to our original question. What ecofeminism is? Does it still exist today? What is it today? As opposed to or as continued from the 1970s? So, Leonor, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that I, I wrote that article is that I really, I wanted to show that there was this continuity. Um, I think that, you know, there, there can be a a kind of misapprehension is to see ecofeminism as something that's sort of exclusively about women, to see it as it's connected to gender identity, um, you know, that it's, it's, you know, not involving men, etc. cetera, is, is a misunderstanding of it. The way that I understand ecofeminism is, is that it's a paradigm that, and, and one of the things that I guess, and I talked about this in the article that really, I guess, helped me to understand this was Carolyn Merchant's book, which was published published in 1980 called The Death of Nature. And she's a brilliant historian of science and talked about, she, she, she you know, kind of just walked through the whole thing about the way that um, Western culture, you know, from the Renaissance on really was sort of predicated on this instrumentalist view of nature, which was parallel to the instrumentalist view of women, that these were this, you know, kind of very similar, the same language. She, she quotes from some of the, you know, the great rationalists like Francis Bacon, um, you know, and, and or Descartes, and the way that they talk about the land, it's, it's, it sounds like the terms of rape. I mean, it, it's, it's just kind of, it's very striking. So what she was talking about was that we, that there are different paradigms for understanding our relationship to nature. Our Western culture, Western society has been ruled since the Renaissance by this kind of extractive domination, dominative, you know, kind of binary view. And that in fact, you know, if you go back earlier in history, or if you go to indigenous cultures, you see a very different kind of, of you know, set of relationships. And that is what I'm calling ecofeminism. So ecofeminism, as defined in that way is not about kind of if you're a man or you're a woman it's not just sort of women artists who are doing ecological art i mean yes there's plenty of male eco-feminists it's it's a philosophy it's a way of thinking about the world as inter interconnected seeing ourselves as part of nature um seeing you know the whole notion of ecology which came out of the 70s it sort of came it gained currency at the same time that feminism um and um uh, the, the, you know, all of these other kind of sort of critiques of, of, of uh, capitalism, militarism, etc. They all came up at the same time. And so I think it's, I, for me, I think it's, of course, very, you know, it, it, it's still very relevant as an idea. Um, but we need to see it as this, as, as a kind of um, philosophy of interconnectedness. And if we think about it that way, then I think we don't sort of worry about, you know, whether we're, you know, excluding this group or that group. Right. I, I also uh, was driven by the realization that for these women in the early 70s, it was pretty crisp clear back then that the abuse of nature, the abuse of women, and the abuse of native people all are grounded in, as somebody just uh, wrote in the chat, book of Genesis. Uh, they're not uh, exclusionary cr Christianity vision of the world. Uh, other systems also came up with this idea of dominance. Uh, but as I, th I think Aviva Ramani pointed out in her writing, the, uh, in King James Bible, the word um, Aramaic word that was supposed to mean care was translated into dominion, yeah. which is a, right, which leads us to the beginning. Yeah. Yes, that dominionism that, you know, although I have to say, I mean, I do a lot of writing also about religion, art and religion, and that, 
it's not it's not necessarily a part of, of even it's sort of the Judeo-Christian traditions because within the Judeo-Christian traditions, there are other non-dominionist ways of thinking about things, particularly within the, the Jewish tradition. Um, this notion of tikkun olam, which is repairing the earth, you know, there and, and within Christianity as well, the idea that we are stewards of the earth and not, not simply, you know, it is not simply just there for us to dominate. So, you know, it, but religion does play some pretty strange roles in all of this. It's, there's no question about that. I wish we had Elaine Ilon with us to discuss Tikkun Olam and, and the tradition of Judaism versus feminism. I wanted to point that earlier, but I didn't want to break Betsy's presentation in the first slide that Betsy showed you from Meditation with the Stones. In Among the people who perform, there is Elaine Ilon, who is also part of our exhibition. Maybe Tyler can show us this image later on for, for the closing of the evening. Betsy, Carla, Eliza, could you comment on ecofeminism, on the idea, on what feminism mean in your perspective from in your personal perspective in your in your in your art whoever wants to speak first <laughs> oh i could say <laughs> um you know i i'm i i i, I do think um yes we are all one people and we have to figure this out okay like what Eleanor said, uh, but, and, okay, women are still oppressed today. <laughs> so it depends on which dimension we have this, this uh, conversation. Um, but I, I, as a woman who had two children and being told that I couldn't be an artist or, you know, people aren't interested in you if you have two children. Um, and I, I, I set out to, for my biggest ideas. And so, yes, being female is completely integral to how, but I had to go on a journey to get her back then to, but what, what any oppression does is it, it dismisses people's thinking, their minds. Our bodies are just an excuse for that, or our color is just an excuse for that, or our, our practice or living in jungle, it's just an excuse to dismiss the brain that is there, the information that is there, the knowledge that is there. So for me personally, I just set out to try and access my own really deep knowledge, my heart, my mind, what makes it thrilled. And that's what I set out to do. And it's, it's a surprise what you end up doing. It's, it's a wonderful surprise. And part of that is connection with people. And I think having children is a no matter how separated i've been or heard or whatever having my children connects me and so i always work with connection there is no other way to work and as audrey lord said without community there's no liberation so very aware that i'm very interdependent and interconnected um to everyone around and in conversation otherwise and also, there's no way we're going to win this thing with the earth if we don't. If we don't want to become one great, big, wonderful, we are doing this as an artist, as an artist. Um, but we could say we're doing it as an engineer or a scientist and to bring all those together, that we have to come together on a way that, we, and that I think that is, will be female led. I really do. <laughs> I really believe that. And <laughs> I was telling somebody, you know, women have more connectors, more neural connectors than men. We have two to three times more. Oh, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we feel that. We feel that. Now, is it significant? No one's proved it. But we feel it. And that's why the women are stepping forward now and leading so powerfully because it's just so clear. It hurts what's wrong. And whether it's a river or people or, you know, it, it's all the same. <laughs> Carla, in a, one of our first conversations, you said that the future is female too. Can you yeah. talk about this from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, when I say that, I don't mean the binary female and male. Like, 
what I mean by that, it's more of an understanding of everybody can have a female side. You know what I mean? It's more about um, the energy that you're putting out in the world and whatever that means, honestly. But like what I think about ecofeminism is, is just so political and radical and so important right now, especially because it comes from an understanding that the patriarchal domination shares the same foundation with racism and other forms of group oppression and that there is no hope that it can be eradicated while the systems remain intact. So it's pretty much the idea that the white male supremacy and its dualism, man versus woman, nature versus science, they were invented to be largely used to justify that systemic explo exploitation. Mm -hmm. They are the basis of the oppressive capitalism we find ourselves in the colonization of people and the colonization of land all comes from the same evil source. So I feel like ecofeminism is to acknowledge that, identify our enemies and fight back as a group. Women, queer, black, indigenous, people of color, land defenders, we all want the same thing and our fight is against the same people. And I feel like that's what's so amazing for me when it comes to the theory of ecofeminism and it really, when I started reading about it, it just really changed my perception of everything because it really answers so many questions that I had before and makes it so clear. And it is this unity, like people fighting together. We're, we're talking about the same source of evil people dominating everything that they can because they love their privileges. How can we fight back? I mean, People call minority a minority, but actually it's the other way around. Minority is the majority nowadays, <laughs> you know? So like if we organize it really well, we're gonna be able to take them out of their comfort zone. And I feel like that's the start. Liza, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, yeah, and I, I think organize ourselves. And I think that's where, you know, my current work is situated you know, it's, it's weaponizing bureaucracy. In some ways, this is the unsexiest thing ever. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's for, forcing a flattening, you know, the a resistance. And, and it's all to get permission to do nothing. Just like Betsy said earlier, a river left alone will clean it itself but getting permission to be left alone. Like I want this, these mineral rights to be left alone. I'd like the land to be left alone. I'd like the, the people who are uh, disproportionately experiencing climate change and ecological injustice to be left alone, um, <laughs> but they're not. And, uh, but to be honest, when I first saw the, the title to the show, I was like, huh. Yeah. I'm not sure that was the place in which the work was conceived, but now, you know, of course there, there, are, there are writers and thinkers and other artists who are, who are associated with ecofeminism that are my influences, but I think uh, what, what being in this show and, and talking with other artists has, I've gotten from is this is a multivalent approach to making work and how, it's, how the work is conceived how it is made and how it is experienced. And so I'm now seeing threads throughout my work that uh, are very empowering. And so I, I've, uh, it's definitely been a rad led to a radicalization of my, my own work and my own process. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. We will be bringing the audience questions and commentaries slowly in. And as a moderator, I have this privilege of uh, taking some liberty here. I said a moment ago that uh, somebody wrote about book, Gen book of Genesis in the chat channel. It was not somebody. It, it's the author of the best uh, article that has so far been written about Betsy's work. And I'm so honored that you're listening. This is Christian Philippon, a text uh, about Betsy in 
Women's Art Journal. And whenever COVID or anything comes and all the libraries are closed, you have everything on your shelves already. So sometimes those niche publications are where you find uh, all the knowledge that you need and uh, I'm so, so very grateful for this article and for your presence with us. I see a question that I was thinking that we should take it with, especially with Alan or sitting here and commenting on religion. There is a very, very strong connection, which I underestimated. And that was a big uh, thing for me to go through this exhibition and the process of, of, of discovering and understanding the complexity of it. What role spirituality and the search, the quest for spirituality plays in that role and not just for indigenous artists who at least we perceive them, we white people, as uh, owning it, but also white women trying to come to terms with either religious systems that they were born into or mm, the, the, the world that they were uh, uh, perceiving or, or learning from, from other people. There was a question here, not a question, but a comment. Let me go a little. Yes, I can read it. How does ecofeminism compare with the indigenous worldviews and philosophies, which are ancient and inclusive, and where we all came from long, long ago, but have forgotten? Would you all like to talk something, some, to talk about it? Well, I mean, I think that, yeah, it's, it's clearly that, you know, that the notion of ecofeminism has a great debt to um, indigenous philosophies and indigenous approaches to land. So, um, you know, we, it, it's about sort of going, you know, that, you know, that sort of Western, as I say, sort of dominating, you know, rationalist paradigm that it was also part of colonialism and sort of wiping all of that out. Um, so this is a process of sort of going back and remembering as well and, and, and rediscovering. So I think it's very important, but this is probably something Carla probably would have more to say about. Um, yeah, I agree 100% with what you said. Um, Ecofeminism also comes from Western culture. So like, I feel like they're very separate, but very inspired on the idea of the way that indigenous communities interact with the land and their surroundings in a non-abusive way, in a non-colonizing way. Um, we, they don't have the idea of othering, you know, like they don't need to take away everything. And I, what I mean, they, I'm talking about the community that I met, but of course, there are many, many layers when you talk about indigenous communities and many layers when you talk about indigenous people. So I feel like that's a very hard um, question to answer, uh, but it's definitely inspired by uh, the way that indigenous people deal with their land, largely, for sure. Um, I don't know how to, yeah, I don't know how to, exactly what what to say. I, I sometimes, I had the same reaction. I, I resist boxes, um, but in fact, almost the way ecofeminism could, could needs to step out of a box. It's not, it's, it's like, it's all inclusive. So that's where I have trouble focusing in. Like, I was gonna give up my my water work. I was so discouraged. I can't tell you how discouraged I was. No one understood what, when I said, let's make a living water system in the United States. When I went to China, they understood what that meant. And they said, yeah. So, um, but before that happened, I, um, I had a very strange journey and I can't, there's no time to go into it, but I got to go up to a, a place in China called the God Water, which had been a protected water site for a Tibetan tribe for 1500 years that had just been turned into a water bottling factory. I'm at this factory and I, I'm not gonna give up my water work. I'm like, I'm broke, I can't do anymore. Um, and I drank this water and my whole body came alive. And I went, oh my God, oh my goodness. I, I can't give up my work. And then after that is when I got to do the other work in China and I got funding anonymously from a phone call and everything like that. But um, these waters, uh, this con connection to land and health, because people were so dependent on that, they had all this knowledge that has been taken and turned into a medicine or into nothing or into a bottling factory. And for called, they call that progress. So it's just, uh, my learning has been kind of like that. <laughs> um, 
And so I set out, I wanted to know more about that culture 13 years later, and I went to research the water culture of the Tibetans, which is undocumented and being destroyed fa fast, incredibly fast. But this was all over the United States too. You know, the indigenous people knew, and because they lived here, they lived here, they knew. And their places were detonated or turned into beer factories or um, destroyed. And uh, why, what, Im but anyway, I won't even go there. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm asking the audience to ask questions. We have plenty of com commentaries and congratulations, but let's leave it aside and we want uh, to use our time the best. So if you have questions, please ask them now. What is interesting, I found other questions before in the feed that were also about spirituality. And I'm very happy that uh, people are seeing this connection. At the beginning, as I said, when I started that research, I was sort of blocked by seeing goddess art as a, as a, as a visual uh, representation of it. And then I, I found uh, that from that foundation, from that search works that were created later, like uh, your uh, Betsy memory of clean water, which is uh, mid 1980s, uh, when there is no re clear representation anymore, but there is clear radical gesture of leaving behind the so-called art world. This is where the search for spirituality really brings us to the, to the sources. You know, I, I just like to say, you know, I thought it was interesting in your, you, um, the way that you organize the show and you talk, you know, ritual being one of the very important sort of elements. And of course, I mean, spirituality is such a, it's such a broad term that sometimes it makes me nervous using it, you know, because it, it means so many different things. But um, I mean, if we think about it, I guess, in terms of, of the notion of ritual, um, and which is also, again, about about a community, um, you know, it, it's about a connection, not only, you know, across the community, but, but connections to larger kind of forces outside of us, um, you know, this, this sort of often the spirit world or whatever. And, and one of the things that I thought was interesting when I was working on my article, I began to realize how many of the kind of pioneering eco-feminists, and I think this is true of, of eco-feminists today as well, they, they started with, or, or an important part of their practice was performance, because of course performance is also, you know, it, it's kind of, I guess, our version of ritual in a way. You know, we, we have lost in Western culture a lot of our rituals, a lot of our sense of, of uh, you know, those kinds of connections. But I thought it was very interesting that so many artists seem to come to this by way of performance. And I think maybe again, that connects to this notion of, of, of spirituality and, um, and ritual and these sort of larger connections. Carla, Eliza, are these subjects is that yeah, would that's, like to touch up on it? That's what we've been looking for, I think, lately, especially this day, is connection, right? And I feel like ritual really allows you, especially when it comes to ritual in nature, it really allows you to have this connection that has been lost. Uh, so many times during, you know, our busy life trying to fit in the system and whatever that means, the things that we have to let go and the boxes that we have to fit in. And I feel like rituals, I mean, in this work that I'm showing um, right now, there is a few rituals happening. There's a group ritual uh, with the indigenous group uh, doing a beautiful ritual around the fire. And there's a lot about connection and evoking spirits and healing. And um, there's also a ritual that I do alone underwater, um, looking at the land and looking at the reflex of uh, nature underwater. And I feel bo like both of them are very healing in that sense of like, you understand, it's almost like a meditation, you understanding that you belong and you're part of either the group or your surroundings or the river that I was bathing in. Eliza? Yeah. Do you so like to add anything? Um, two things. Uh, the, the first is, in my, my work specifically, I think it's almost a deflection of the ritual that I've inherited. That, you know, my, my, quite literally my inheritance, but there's a culture in that, that if it's documented, it's real. And if it's not documented, it's not real. 
Um, you know, the oil companies have to trace back ownership to what they call ownership to patent. And what that means is the first, you know, settler colonizer. So any ownership that pre, pre, predated that is irrelevant from a, a legalistic standpoint. Um, but I, I think I, I want to push back a little bit about on the uh, science and engineering in Western culture as forever and always uh, promoting a violent dualism. We know where we are and we know a lot of how we got here, but there are other voices that have been squelched um, in, in um, there, there are many voices that have been squashed, but specifically within the Western tradition. I'm thinking of Alexander von Humboldt, who basically uh, created what we think of as ecology. Uh, he was also an abolitionist. He was an anti-colonist. He was, uh, as far as anyone can guess, he was also gay. So he came from a very different positioning. So even as, as he was working for the uh, it, for empire, he, he tried to be uh, a more re a more observant voice of what how n new these new natural environments new to the West anyway, uh, how the people in the environment interact. Um, and also, I'm sure a lot of the people here um, are familiar with Robin Kimmerer's work, um, braiding sweet grass. And so she's an ecologist at uh, in Syracuse, but she also has, is native. And so she, in this beautiful book, she knits together these two sp perspectives. And it's a really beautiful book. And if you, anyone here um, is interested in that, in that I, I suggest they look it up. And I'll, I'll, put, a, I'll put a notice in the chat. Um, I'll go. I'll go back and I'll chime in on ritual. There were also additional questions here in the feed about ritual. In the exhibition, you have the works by Agnes Dennis, for example, uh, which is titled "The Rice Tree Bur Burial." And the first idea for this first iteration of this work was realized in 1968 and is considered to be the first uh, echo work done outside uh, uh, on on the, on the site and site specific and she organized it as a private ritual and then repeated in 10 years later more or less in Lewiston, New York near Niagara Falls during three summers 77, 78 and 79 repeating one of those uh, one of one of the three parts of the ritual once again and they were strictly tied to the idea of the natural cycle of life where from birth through growing slow decay and death we embrace life in its changed and it's constantly changing and evolving um, sort of march without trying to point or pinpoint or create anything that is definite, ideal, or a masterpiece. And that is in a very, for artists, for the feminist artists that I worked with, it's a very direct um, statement that they made on the classical art or the art at the moment uh, when they uh, became of age and that they, they sort of had to fight against the painting and what painting was at that time. Uh, and other artists who did it um, also as much, much more um, um, lim invisible interventions in the landscape is of course Anna Mendieta, who considered to be uh, torn of the womb. This is uh, the phrase that she persistently used in her in her writing, and she meant both being torn from her Cuban from her family in Cuba and from from the land. And the work in the exhibition Bakayu, which uh, pays homage to goddesses of Taino people, um, but in its shape actually references the European Paleolithic Venuses. Um, and there is also a text that Mendieta wrote about La, Ven uh, La Venus Negra for heresies at that time. Uh, she, she's typing to all of these ideas, trying to reconnect uh, with nature in, in a sort of private ritual. She started it with silhouettes, uh, putting her body uh, out there in landscape. And um, the rule was that there are no viewers. We only um, look at this works in retrospect through the documentation and photography and then and in, in the videos. And some contemporary artists still do that. The ritual um, understood as, you know, somewhere between 
um, performance art and somewhere between a spiritual, looking for spiritual connection is still present in that work. Yeah, and I just, yeah, I was just had a thought. I mean, I guess one of the essences of ritual too is, you know, these are things, things that are repeated. So there's a notion, I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about time and, you know, I think that, well, this is a whole different project I've worked uh -huh. on about the apocalypse and the kind of linear notion of time going towards, uh -huh. you know, the end. But but ritual is, is about a more cyclical time. And that's also, I think, in terms of, Ecofeminism, you know, it, it's to, to think about things, you know, we, I mean, we, we, we have all the, the you know, the, the cycle of the seasons, you know, the cycle of the day, we have these, these cycles. Um, and, you know, it, in a way, the, the cycles help us to, you know, not succumb to what um, Smithson called ecological despair, the notion that it's just all going to end. So ritual is about, about a different concept of time. And I think that's, that's kind of important um, because a more linear notion of time, you know, seems to, it, 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 it's the way that it precludes possibilities, I guess, you know, that you think it's, it's all running down towards the end and there's nothing that we can do. Whereas a cyclical, cyclical notion of time is about regeneration and rebirth. So, I mean, I think that's maybe an important element here as well. Yes, and Aviva Rahmani, I think, uh, said in the last conversation that we had that actually there is also a, a very secular way of, of, of seeing it, uh, because for a woman, the life is made of repetitive actions, which all become rituals, from cleaning from you know organizing ritual uh, not ritual the, the everyday logistics uh, that it taps eventually into becoming a sort of ritual and i found her note uh, very interesting her point um let me see what other questions we have uh, there's plenty of them and it's not so easy to to read them somebody's asking about motherhood whether motherhood uh in any way changed your relationship to the art and affected your your art so whoever could talk about that uh, that could be very interesting i also saw uh, let me see if we have other questions so that i could bring them uh here quickly as you think somebody is asking about the uh, the black lives uh, matter movement and how does it impact uh, your practices and i guess also my choices for the exhibition will answer that um, what else do we have here? Um, uh, somebody's also trying to, to repeat my question earlier to, for the artist to either identify as eco-feminists or not. And I, I think that I should also respond to that. Uh, talking to the artists in the exhibition, I, I often hear from them that they should, would not like to be labeled. And I have to state it once and again and repeat it uh, regularly that this is, that I think ecofeminism as an idea is definitely not the only way through which uh, we could perceive the, the creativity of these women. It's just one of the ways uh, from which we can look at them. But I come from the perspective of a feminist art historian and I simply know why uh, successful women painters in 19th century did not become part of the art history because nobody wrote about them. And if when we write, when we take it down to posteriority, at least we hope for that, we have to use words and words and labels are limiting. But I always hope that somebody else will also write from a different perspective. And then this dialogue will eventually pass something down to those who will come after us. I just don't want women to reinvent the wheel every generation. Would you like to talk about motherhood or Black Lives Matter? Um, I'll say a couple words, but I don't know. I, I mean, um, but first I just want to thank you and Thomas, but um, motherhood is huge. It's probably the hardest job there is for which you are totally not acknowledged. And everything that goes wrong is blamed on you for your children when you have to send them to horrible schools and there's not enough resource or you don't have health, you know, you don't have, um, you know, good food or housing for them or there's just, that wasn't my situation, but 
I see that all the time and it's part, very much part of Black Lives Matter. And um, I don't know a friend of mine, uh, I don't have a, I mean, a black mother that every mother I know who's black cannot go to sleep till her son is in the door, mm. in the door. And it, it doesn't matter what education or economic level they're at, it's true. And I have friends who's had their sons killed. So Black Lives Matter is huge. And we did a neighborhood thing in my, in my neighborhood, um, posting and, um, but it's, um, and I, I even see that in people talking about this exhibition, um, that the work of the two indigenous women isn't mentioned as much. And I think we all have to, as I'm a white person, become more and more and more aware, constantly. It's just, it's constantly. And because um, it's heartbreaking that we live in this, with this, these oppressions, which are so cruel. And um, so that's, what I have to say, but being a parent, it was, it is the hardest thing there is. And children used to be taken care of. In so, um, uh, but now it's up to two people. And I can say that two adults with one child is not enough mm. resource. It's not enough resource. You know, that people aren't living multi-generationally. And we're going to go back to that with what's happening. We're going to go back to living multiple communities, small communities taking care of each other. That's the only way we will come through this crisis. And the crisis isn't going away. Um, it's going to continue um, until we get it right. <laughs> and we don't have one crisis. All those crises come together. All together. And they're, they only, they're all they one. They made each other more visible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everything's been exposed. I mean, I, that's where I guess the link between Black Lives Matter, you know, ecofeminism, the, you know, COVID. I mean, they, one of the things that people are talking about is that with COVID, you know, women are sort of sliding back and, you know, they, they're the ones that have to take care of the kids and the kids can't go to school. And, you know, it's, it's exposing all the fault lines, you know, it, it's like everything seems to be kind of coming to a head and it, it's horrible. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be an optimist and I think it, it could also mean that something new, we, we, this could be a moment when we really do break some things open and, and some real change could be possible. Yeah, 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 it will be, it has to be. I honestly, I lived in China for 10 years. I was there during SARS. I have never in my life seen people help each other so much. Really, everybody's survival. It, 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 there's things about that culture. Their, their social safety nets are so much in place, comparatively. Right. They are. So, you know, we, ours aren't. Why? <laughs> Capitalism. Yeah. yeah. So, I, yeah. I could speak, but I think that I'd rather have Carla speak as the youngest uh, to sort of top it before I... Uh, before I close it, we should hear from the young genera youngest generation as well. Yep. But I think uh, that it's being like this big thing about the Black Lives Matter movement right now. It's not a new movement. It didn't start the other day. Um, <laughs> but the reason why it's so powerful right now and it became one of the largest movements that happened in the USA, it's, it's because of this unity. It's because of this understanding that uh, those minorities are going through this oppression through, from the same uh, source. And I mean, you see so many people getting together. It's not only black people, it's black people, it's people of color, it's Latinx, it's immigrants. We're all together fighting against the same source. And I feel like that's so empowering to see. And it really shows the force that the people have, the power that the people have, um, quoting Patti Smith, <laughs> um, power to the people, you know? And I feel like all these minorities getting together right now um, and understanding that they do have power over the systemic oppression that we're going through. And if we really speak up, there will be some changes happening because we are gonna outnumber them if we really rebel against that. So I feel like that's the beginning of the revolution, or at least that's how I want to look at it. Right, right. Um, we could continue and I should probably also answer, but the question, the question came from the person whom, with whom I already spoke. So I don't want to take the airtime. I'd rather, I really wanted you to, to speak and I don't want to prolong it. Um, 
I wanted to thank you all. I also wanted to thank you all for something much more special than this one conversation. I had a very, you know, putting a show during a pandemic uh, was, was kind of a crazy thing to do. We actually thought with Thomas that everybody else was doing that too, because this was something that we found our, our intellectual and, and mental freedom in doing, uh, pursuing the goal, not being sure when we will be able to show it and postponing, postponing, postponing. We were considering, of course, canceling. We were post considered uh, considering the second time when, when the uh, protest started and we were not sure if it's the time for this show. Uh, then we thought of uh, bringing it to 2021 and then eventually we opened it. Um, so, you know, putting together a logistical uh, effort when you don't know what's the day of your opening is just absolutely insane. When uh, the storages are, with art are closed and people who uh, confirmed the availability of work to you two months ago are no longer employed and they don't answer emails because they are furloughed. This is the reality, uh, a very, very grim reality in which we created this, but it became, I think, with every day, freedom for a larger group of people. And I felt this enormous sense of community with my artists. I'm very grateful to them. Not just as usual, we're grateful for their trust in giving us the works to the show. I'm grateful for their support throughout this process and from for so many private exchanges and personal thoughts and checking on each other every day and uh, giving each other power and support. And I, th I hope that the show was the same to you. And I have to say that uh, it became bigger with Eleanor and Julie Rice and, and Candice Hopkins joining us in these conversations, not to mention the gallery, of course, who made it all possible. But then again, critics, critics who came and who, enlarge this conversation that we can have it today with much larger society. And of course, the subject is not new. There is enormous literature and I'm so happy to see all these people who wrote about this before chiming in the chat and, and being here with us. So thank you all, it's our exhibition. And by the way, uh, because it became bigger and bigger, Thomas decided to reopen the show in September and it will be open again from September the 8th through the September, September 26th. But uh, remember that you can see all of it online. There are all materials and we will um, be happy to continue this conversation. Thank you all so very much. <laughs>